this together and rejoice in the truth of it. Turning in God's word to 2 Kings and the chapter number 6. 2 Kings and the chapter number 6. And this is our 14th message on the life of Elisha. It's our final one at the moment in this series because we're moving to something else uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, and then we'll come back to this next summer in the will of the Lord. We're living in spirit. And certainly finish off then this series on the life of Elisha. But today we want to read from verse number 8 down to verse number 18. And this takes place after the miracle has occurred of the iron axe head being made to float. And then we read from verse number 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, 
will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, he thither, he thither horses, sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the reading of thy truth. This is thy word. And therefore, it deserves our reverence, our attention, our obedience. And we pray that thou will take away all distractions this morning as we consider what the Lord would say to us at this time. We thank thee and we praise thee, Lord, for the open book. And we pray that thou will empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit and give me help to proclaim the truths of this book to this congregation. May God be glorified. May a spiritual work be done in hearts today. May the church of Jesus Christ be built up and strengthened. We pray in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen and amen. When we last looked at 2 Kings chapter 6, we saw the Lord's provision for an individual whose iron axe head had fallen into the river. And we learned that the Lord is able to lift those things that have sunken. We know that the Lord uh, lifted the sinner up and has saved them. And each one who has saved today can say from sinking sands, he lifted me with tender hands. He lifted me and praise God. He can still lift sinners today that call upon his name. He can lift backsliders out of their coldness and their apathy. He can lift the problems and burdens of the believer and carry them through. He can lift a group of people, whether it be a church or whether it be a nation. God can work in miraculous way and lift that which by nature is fallen and sunk. We now read of the Lord's intervention and interest in a nation, not in an individual this time, but in a nation, in a multitude of people, how he provided for them and protected them at this time when the enemy sought to destroy Israel. And there's two instances that I want us to look at, and the first one is found from verses 8 down to verse number 12. And in verse number 8 we read, the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Now it's interesting to note the name of the person who is the enemy, because he is called the king of Syria. Some Bible commentators believe that it is the same king of Syria as found in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 5, where it says, And the king of Syria said, Go to go, and I will send a letter Onto the king of Israel. And that king of Israel sent Naaman to Israel to have a healing from his leprosy. Although he didn't understand how it was going to come, uh, come, up, come about, he didn't understand who he was to send him to because he sent him to the king. And of course, Elisha heard about it and called for Naaman. Now, if that was the same king, if that was the same king of Israel, how great is his wickedness in coming to attack Israel, the land from which his help came. And what a picture this is of the sinful, 
unregenerate, ungrateful heart of fallen man. God had blessed the king of Syria by healing one of his most notable military men. But rather than returning praise to the Lord, he starts to plot against the land where God had placed that prophet and where God had a testimony of worship throughout that land through the sons of the prophets. I wonder, does his behavior describe you today? I wonder, are you like the king of Syria? Have you been guilty of seeking for God to heal you or one of your family members? And you've asked for prayer for such healing. And you've reached out and called on God to heal. And God has healed. But today, just like the king of Syria, you're found in rebellion against God. Because remember, if you're not saved and washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are an enemy of God, you're fighting against God, and you're rebelling against God. You see, you've used God. You've used God and called on God for healing, but you still refuse him. You refuse his authority. You refuse his word. You refuse his son. You refuse his blood and the salvation wrought on Calvary. What ingratitude today. What wickedness. How will you stand before God, having sought the favors of God, but never the grace of God? Friend, how will you stand before the judgment seat, having dealt so appallingly with your creator? I'm just interested in you when it suits me, but I don't want you, God. You know, we should not be surprised when the enemy attacks. We should never be surprised that there is always an enemy against the people of God. There is always an enemy working up schemes and plans. God had worked a miracle. People were rejoicing in the school of the prophets and the sons of the prophets. And that news would have spread out as they took their meetings and they taught the truths of scripture. They were told about how the Lord worked miraculously among them. So God had worked. The people were rejoicing. The work of God was progressing. Remember that they had to build new accommodation because there were so many people training for the ministry. They were building they were rejoicing. God was moving and the enemy was plotting and planning. The enemy rose up with a focus and with a purpose. And notice what the king of Syria says in verse number eight. In such and such a place shall be my camp, my camp. That's all he's interested in is what he feels he can do. Thoughts of his power, his ability, his plans. No thoughts of God. No thoughts before God. And you know, some people get a little influence sometimes or they get a little power and they get carried away with themselves and they get filled up with pride. Sometimes it happens in different avenues of life. Maybe someone's in charge of people in their workplace. Maybe someone gets elected to a government position. Maybe someone has authority in a congregation. And you know what? Sometimes that little bit of power influence goes to their head. And they forget that they're before God. And their plans are seen by God. And they will answer and be accountable before God. And many assume, like this king, my camp, my plans will be established. This is what I will do, and it shall be done. For him, whenever we come to verse number nine, we read that God knew all about the plans. And the man of God, that is Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place. For hither, thither or there, the Syrians are come down. So, Elisha is made aware by the Lord of the attack that's coming against Israel. You see, the king of Syria never considered God. God was not in his thoughts in any shape or form. And yet we know from this passage, we know, of course, from Scripture, from our teaching on Tuesday night at the prayer meeting from Psalm 139, that God knows all about his people. God knows all about everyone for that matter. 
He knows every single thing. He knows the thought that is on your mind. He knows the word on your tongue before you even speak it. And friend, that's a wonderful comfort for the Christian, that God knows all about me. There's nothing I face or go through, but the Lord knows about it. And the Lord will meet me at the point of my need. It's a great motivation for the Christian. Because if the Lord knows all about me, I want to live a life that's honourable, that brings glory to him, that the smile of God will be upon me. But that thought that God knows all about me is a terror for the unsaved, for the ungodly. And that's why they often close the Bible. That's why they don't come to church. That's why they hate the preaching of the gospel, because it reminds them that God knows them altogether. And they would rather walk away from such teaching and deceive themselves into thinking it's all okay. And I sin unto myself and no one else. But sin is truly against God. And sinner, if you're not saved, on the day of judgment, God will reveal who and what you truly are. Nothing will be hidden. Everything will be brought into the light. Remember what the Lord said, the things done in secret, done in the darkness, will be proclaimed from the rooftops. In other words, everybody will know who you truly are. And therefore that thought, God knows everything about me. For the saved, it's a blessing. For the unsaved, it brings great dread. And you know, God has also revealed the plans of our enemy to us in this day and in this generation. There are three enemies that every Christian has. Three enemies that the Bible warns us about. And just like God told Elisha about the enemies of Syria, so God tells you and me today about the enemies that come against our soul. I want you to turn to three simple verses with me. First Peter chapter 5. And in First Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, we read these words. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So you're not the only one facing the attack of the devil. We all face it. It's a face by all the brethren, all the sisters that are in the world. So there's your first enemy. Your first enemy is the devil, Satan. He's known in scripture as a liar. We know that he is so deceitful. So that's the first enemy that wars against the soul. Then if you turn over just a couple of pages to 1 John, and the book of 1 John, and the chapter number 3. And in chapter 3, verse number 3, it says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. And here is the second enemy of the Christian. It is the world. Now, what do we mean when we say the world? We mean the system of the world. We mean the way of the world. The natural order of the world is sinful. And therefore, it hates the Christian because Christianity goes against the natural order of this fallen world. But if you turn over just one page there to chapter 5 of First John, we read two other things. Verse 19, And we know that we are of God and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. This is a wicked world we live in. And friend, if someone is in the world without the gospel, without the light, they will continue in that wickedness. That will be their natural condition. But if you look up there at verse number five, it says, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And therefore, we see with the devil, we are to resist him. So there is victory in Christ over the devil. We see that if we have faith in the Lord, and that faith is obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can overcome the world. And then turn to Galatians chapter 5, because this is the third enemy that wars against our soul. And if you're struggling for things to pray about, dear believer, why not pray? Lord, deliver me from the world and from the devil, and here, thirdly, from the flesh. Look at verse number 17 of Galatians 5. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. The word lust means a desire. 
So therefore, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. In other words, the flesh desires to do things that are sinful, things that are against God. And the spirit desires to do the things that are spiritual and holy and honorable. But there's a battle, isn't there? And that battle will go on in our hearts until the day we're called home. And then we'll be made like Christ. How do we overcome the lust of the flesh or the desires to do that which is sinful? Well, verse 16 says, This this I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You see, some people ask the question, how do I stop doing the things that are wrong? And they have this idea, I have to stop and then I focus on doing the things that are right. The answer to stopping the things that are wrong, the answer to saying no to sin is to do what is right. So therefore, whenever you desire to tell a lie or that temptation comes within your heart to tell a lie to get you out of a tight spot, do what is right. And you'll have victory over it. And the next time it'll be much easier to defeat. And therefore, walk in the Spirit. In other words, obey God. Go through with God. And that's the best way to overcome the flesh and the desires of the sinful nature. So we have three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We know who these, what these enemies are. We know that the desire of the enemy of the soul is to make sinners content in their sin to make them ignorant of their need, to make them foolish in their decisions, to make them deny their creator. I've read, I've described an unsaved person today. Because today you're content in your sin, otherwise you'd be saved. Today you're ignorant of your need, otherwise you'd be saved. Today you deny your creator, otherwise you'd be saved. Today you're living in foolishness, otherwise you'd be saved. And that's what the enemy does. He seeks to uh, manipulate and continue to keep in the bondage of sin those who are born into this world, all who are born into this world without Christ. We're told that the devil can appear as an angel of light. He can appear so plausible that it almost seems that what he is tempting you to do is the best thing is the easy option, is going to work out okay in the end. But we must be alert to his strategies. Be sober, be vigilant. How do we do that? What is it that we do that will give us victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil? We come to the word of God. We know what God's word says. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that is the only part of the armor that is the attacking part. Why? Because it's only through the word of God we can defeat the devil, we can defeat the world, we can defeat the flesh in our lives. Now, as Christians, we know the truth. Just like Elisha knew the truth that day, just like Elisha knew the truth that day, we know the truth today. What did Elisha do? Did he keep it to himself? No, we read that the man of God sent on to the king of Israel saying, beware, he warned. He warned. And that is what the church of Jesus Christ is to do. And that is what the Christian is to do. We are to declare the truth, not our opinions about the truth, but the truth of Jesus Christ as revealed in the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And friend, we have to simply preach the word of God. That's what he has called us to do. Why? Because it warns against the devil. It warns against the world. It warns against the flesh. It warns against hell. And it presents a glorious savior who is able to deliver us from them all and make us right for heaven. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we open this book. That's why the message is a message of the Lord. And we turn you to book, chapter, and verse every time we stand in this pulpit. Because the message of man will fail. But praise God for his unchanging word. And not only are we to preach the word, it's in season, out of season. When people want to hear it and when people don't want to hear it. Why? Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, that's desires, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth 
and shall be turned onto fables. And friend, that's why I am always alarmed when believers don't want to come to a gospel meeting. When believers don't want to come to an evening service. But I'm saved anyway. No, that's not what it is. You are to be under the sound of the teaching of the word of God. And sadly today, there's some people and the gospel's not enough. They want something else. They want something new. Friend, the word of God is old yet ever new. The word of God is sufficient because it's God's word. The word of God has been given. It's a life-giving word. It's a life-changing word. How dare we ever consider that we need something else or some other topic or stop the gospel service and start doing something else? No, we need the word of God. That's the secret of the early church. It says in Acts 4, or Acts 8, 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Acts 13, 5, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God. Acts 14, 25, And when they had preached the word in Perga, and again, and again, and again, and again, it was a preaching of the word of God. And friend, that's all that matters, because that's all that will save the soul of men and women. 1 Peter chapter 1, 25, But the word of God endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Sometimes the word of God can be abused. Sometimes preachers can abuse their position and they can start to put their opinion into their message. And through that opinion, try and present some teaching that, friend, is not found in the word of God. Let me give you an example. I remember as a child being at a meeting one time and it was a prophecy meeting. And in that meeting, the man stood in the pulpit and he started preaching about the end times. And he told us with all certainty and with full conviction on his part that the end of the world was coming in 10 to 12 years' time. Now, at that time, Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. And she was so obviously part of this end time scheme. And then he read a couple of verses and read a wee bit of that verse and a wee bit of that verse. So Margaret Thatcher, you keep your eye on Margaret Thatcher. And she was going to herald in this. And if she wasn't the Antichrist, she was the next thing to it. And within the next few years, this was all going to be revealed. Ten years, twelve years at the very most, this world's coming to an end. And then the meeting ended. The king is coming, the king is coming. Friend, Margaret Thatcher is dead and gone. She's gone to meet her maker. We're more than 10 to 12 years from that service. So what was that I listened to? Let me tell you what it was. A pile of nonsense. A pile of absolute nonsense and garbage. And sadly, there are people today and they get hold of something. And they're so convinced it's right, they'll look through the Bible to get one wee bit of a verse and start preaching that and that's all they're interested in. This wee topic or that wee topic. It's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And that's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be doing. Just because someone says or tags a Bible verse onto their opinion does not mean that that opinion is true. But praise God, we can never fail when we're in this book. This is God's word. This is the gospel. Unless you knew the plan of God and told it. And today, Christians are so busy running in this direction and that direction. And friend, they're not sharing the gospel. And there are people in their neighborhoods and in their schools and in their churches and in their uh, workplaces and they're going to hell. And they don't talk about the gospel. They're not worried about the gospel. They're caught up with the events of today and that's it. That's as far as it goes. Friend, Jesus, Jesus only saves He's the one that needs to be presented. He's the one that needs to be lifted up. He is the only redeemer of God's elect. I your duty and mine is to be witnesses for him. Not for people's opinions, but for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to be caught up in something. It's easy through fear to get caught up. 
But I'm reminded of those wonderful, precious words in John chapter 16 that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke unto his disciples. And he said, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In me you might have peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And whenever tribulations come into this world and difficulties come into this world, Sometimes Christians panic and sometimes they're so fearful and they're afraid and they think something's wrong. Well, I'm reading the word of God and the Lord says, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And we are not to live in fear of what is going on in this world. Friend, we are to do what the Lord has asked us to do. We are to live in the victory and preach the gospel and preach the gospel it doesn't matter what the message is. The gospel is the most important message men and women, boys and girls, need to hear. You see, agreement with man doesn't bring peace to your soul. You can have a group of people agreeing on something or some topic together, but friend, that doesn't bring peace to your soul. Peace to your soul is brought upon resting on the word of God and upon his word alone. That's why he said, these things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. Many a time in my life, I have been worried, I've been fearful, anxious, not knowing the next step ahead. And I've come to the word of God and there's been a word for my soul. It's brought peace, it's brought comfort. Why? Because that's exactly what the word of God is supposed to do to those who love God. How can you, dear Christian, sit by quietly knowing about the enemy? Knowing about the desire of the devil for your loved ones? How can you sit by quietly as they go to a lost eternity? There are many running to promote sin. But are you willing to promote Christ? Are you willing to be, come to the prayer meeting and pray that the enemy's plans will be made known and defeated in your life and in the life of others? And look what it says in verse number 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice. It happened repeatedly. Again, and again, and again, and again. And the devil does attack continually. And repeatedly, the attacks of the devil, the flesh, the world come to us. But God is always able. He's always able. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Which of us is for the king of Israel? Of Israel. What happens in verse 11? There's confusion in the enemy's camp. And there's suspicion. And the king of Assyria assumes that one of his personal servants is leaking information. And he's got someone that can't be trusted in his camp. And that person's taking the plans that he's made and he's running out and he's telling someone to pass it on to the king of Syria. And he wants to find out who is the deceitful one in the group. But one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But it's Elisha. It's Elisha. You see, just like the king of Syria, this world often underestimates the Christian. They forget about them. But here's a man who realized that there was a prophet thwarting the enemies of God. There was a believer. There was a Christian thwarting the enemies of God. I'm saying that's part of the work that we have been brought to this world to do. To fight against the enemies of God. Not in their own strength. Not in their own power. But in the place primarily of prayer. That's the first place we fight. No point you fighting elsewhere if you're not first pray praying. And then in our lives by faithfulness, by testimony, by holiness, 
Friend, we are fighting on a daily basis showing that Christ is victorious and he is able to keep us from falling. He is faithful to keep us from falling. And here we find that God has worked another miracle. You say, what's the miracle? The miracle is that God has revealed to Elisha the attack of the enemy and Elisha has been able to get it, avoid it. And friend, God's still doing those miracles today. And whenever you open the word of God, God, by his power, shows you who your enemy is, his characteristics, things to look out for. And praise God, he is able to deliver you. We're told, take heed. Take heed. Beware. Have you been taking heed today? Have you prayed that your soul be protected today? Have you prayed that your mind would be protected today from the enemies of the gospel and of the Lord? If you pray that your loved ones today would realize that the enemy of the soul wants nothing but damnation for them. But Christ wants to deliver them and to save them. Are you willing to join in the fight against the devil? Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to tell others? Are you willing to bring people to the house of God that they may hear words whereby they can be saved? Are you willing to say, Lord, I'll fight, I'll stand, I'll go? Praise God for one man who was faithful. What about you? What about you? Will you be faithful today? Will you trust in the Lord? Will you join the ranks? Does hell know you? Do they know your name? As a person who's thwarting the enemy, a person who's receiving victory through Christ, do they know what night prayer meeting is? Because you're always there. Friend, be faithful in the work of God. Warn. Preach Christ. Pray. And compel the unsaved to come. I'm going to continue this passage. Because I've only got halfway through. I'm going to continue this passage this evening. I'm going to finish from verse 13 down to verse number 18. And we do trust and pray that the Lord will bless it as we preach it this evening. But we're going to close by singing uh, one hymn, When You Feel the Weakest Danger Surround. Just two verses of that hymn. Subtle temptations, troubles abound. And we'll just sing the first and the last verse of this hymn. And we'll remain seated as we sing. pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and we praise thee that there is faith. There is faith that is a gift of God. And we pray, O Lord, with the words of Scripture, Lord, you'll increase our faith. 
And, O oh Lord, help us to continually trust in thee. Lord, we pray that we will be like Elisha, and we will warn our friends and our family and our loved ones of the reality of the enemy. And, O oh Lord, that we will pray against him, and we will tell him about a Savior who's able to deliver and to save. Lord, I thank thee for faithful people and the lives of each believer here who were faithful to our soul and brought us to the truth of the gospel. Thank you for the day, Lord, you opened our eyes to see. And my prayer is, Lord, that this day, if there's one not saved in this gathering, that they will put their faith and their trust in the risen Savior. Oh, Lord, save today, we pray. Oh, Lord, we pray that God's people will have a burden to get the lost in under the sound of the word. Pray that God's people, Lord, will not lose the focus and not lose, Lord, what the most important thing is, and that is the preaching of the Word of God. And we pray, O Lord, that through the preaching and the labors of this congregation, that we'll see many people added on to the kingdom. Lord, you brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. We thank you the gospel is able. And we pray, Lord, that you will move and work even this day and bring souls onto thyself. Lord, bless thy people. What has been of man, let it fall to the ground and perish. What has been of God, let it live on and prosper. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen.